Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to New Books in Sports, a channel on the New Books Network. My name is Keith Rathbone, and I'm coming to you from Macquarie University here in sunny Sydney. And I tell you what, it is really sunny today. And I'm here today to speak with Michelle Marino, who is the Deputy Director of the Indiana Historical Bureau, a division of the Indiana State Library, and is the author of what I thought was just a fascinating book. And it was a really fun read, uh, which is called Roller Derby, The History of an American Sport. It's out from University of Texas Press in 2021. Thank you so much for joining me, Michelle. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. Now, Michelle, um, you have you have your own like really fascinating backstory with roller derby. So I, I would love for you to just start out by telling us a little bit how you developed the project and kind of what's your connection to, to roller derby. Sure. Um, in some ways, it, it goes back a little bit further um, than just roller derby. Um, I consider myself an athlete. You know, whether I'm good or not is always debatable, <laughs> but um, I grew up playing sports. Um, I am a Hoosier at heart. Um, I was actually born in Wisconsin, but grew up in Indiana and now live back in Indiana as well, Um, but grew up in small town Indiana and basketball was king. So that was my sport of choice growing up. I played for a couple years in college um, and I was just thinking about this before we started chatting. I, I really think in some ways that's where I started thinking more deeply, perhaps my, I don't know, 18 to 20 year old brain certainly wasn't fully formed, but um, about sport and identity and in in part how much that meant to me to be a basketball player and to be an athlete. And when I stopped playing in college, that really shook me, I think, to my co- to my core. And I was really always looking for another sport or to get back into it um, in, in a different way. So of course, I graduate college, eventually go get my master's and then PhD. And when I was in um, Amherst, Massachusetts, getting my doctorate um, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, I knew that I wanted to study basketball in some way for my dissertation and wanted to do a deep dive into the history of women's sports. Um, And so I had an advisor, uh, Chris Oppie, um, who's very well known for his work in Vietnam, but has also done some sports history as well. you know, suggested that I look at a comparative sport, um, a more traditional, or I wanted to look at basketball, of course, uh, but he wanted me to compare, I guess, with a non-traditional sport. And so, you know, there was this sort of moment, I remember sitting in his office on campus and he was like, how about roller derby? And in my mind, I was like, what about roller derby? Like I had very vague images of, and I mentioned this in the book too, but of like seeing it on like cable TV in the late nineties and they were you know, wearing spandex and on rollerblades. And I didn't really know much about the history of it at all. And so I was like, you know, what about it? You know, okay, I'll look into it. And I, I did, I started researching it and then, um, you know, was just fascinated about what I was learning, about how long it had been around, that it had been co-ed, and there were all these really interesting gender dynamics. Um, But at the same time, this was happening in, uh, I think about that time was 2008, 2009, there had been a resurgence of modern roller derby. And so I started just, you know, digging into the local team. Um, You know, I, I kept seeing articles about the local team, which was Pioneer Valley Roller Derby popping up. Um, in sort of the alternative newspapers and then could check them out on the website. And I was like, well, you know, if I want to know more about the sport, I should try it out. Like I said, I'm an athlete at heart. Um, I like to, I am super competitive. So um, I'm like, well, I should just go see what this is about to better understand it. And it wasn't intended. I didn't want it to be like a covert participant thing where I was like doing this underground and not letting anybody know, Um, about it or anything, but I just wanted to learn more about it so I could better understand it as I was researching it. So I did go and try out and ended up um, joining the league uh, and skated with Pioneer Valley Roller Derby for several years. So I I actually did start researching it first. And then, like I said, um, you know, wanted to understand it better. And to do that, I felt like I needed to actually try to play it. Um, which was really important because it helped me understand the nuances between the old game and what had been in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 
really all the way through the 1970s, and then this modern resurgence that people are pretty familiar with now. Yeah, I loved, I loved, um, I loved the idea of embodied histories, like that we need to have some sense of, you know, the a- effective work that maybe our subjects do in order to really understand them, especially for sports historians. And we, I think we rarely kind of write about it, but so many sports historians are athletes, you know, Monke, like, or former athletes. But uh-huh. you're, you're, you were an athlete kind of the entire time. Like you kept, you kept uh, roller derbying as, as you're writing and you, there are parts in your book where you refer back to kind of your own experience. So I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how, you know, kind of expand a little bit on how that playing of roller derby um, helped you better understand kind of what your historical subjects were, were doing. Yeah, it definitely helped. And to be honest, at times it hindered it a little bit too, which is interesting to think about. Um, you know, on one hand, I, I came to learn how to skate and the problems that you could have with that and, um, you know, team dynamics and playing a co-ed sport, what that looked like, which was also a unique situation that I found myself in, which connected me back to the old game of roller derby. Um, it has been co-ed from its inception in 1935 and remained so through the main roller derby organization, the Seltzer Family Roller Derby, which folded in the mid-1970s. But I joined one of the handful of co-ed modern roller derby leagues. So when I was studying the sport, like it did not phase me that it was co-ed because our league was co-ed. But the modern resurgence of the game that came about um, out of Texas it, um, post 2001 was mostly feminist driven, um, women only leagues. And I understand and respect that space too. And we can come back to that as well. Um, but there were just a handful of co-ed leagues that had popped up again in this modern resurgence. But, um, so I felt like that also gave me a unique perspective because that was the sporting experience I was having as well. Although, um, we weren't necessarily on the same team or scoring in the same format as the, um, uh, older game. Um, but again, uh, when I was skating, it helped me um, also form contacts and networks. Um, there had been a lot of former skaters that in the early years of the modern resurgence had volunteered and offered to help train uh, modern skaters and modern leagues and sort of the nuances of the game. Um, some of those relationships were really good and some weren't. And so a lot of bridges were burnt as well. Um, But in particular, there were a couple folks in my league that knew some of the old skaters or had even made contact with Jerry Seltzer, um, who was the second owner of the roller derby. Uh, His father, Leo Seltzer, founded the sport in the 1930s, um, and they were able to sort of put me in touch with people I needed to interview, um, both of the old game and, and the new. And so it really helped me, again, not only as an athlete, understanding the ins and outs of the sport and the differences in the rules from what had been previously to the modern game, but then making those connections of people I needed to be in touch with and interview um, to get the, you know, firsthand skater experience and perspective. Um, And then, as I mentioned in the book too, just, you know, I didn't know how to skate when I started. I mean, I had (laughs) skated like a, a handful of times, like growing up at like the roller cave for like an eighth grade birthday Double party stage. or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Like I was not good. I did not own a pair of skates, you know. Um, and so it was really scary trying out at first. And, and even though I had played, you know, basketball, volleyball, uh, softball, all these sports in the past, you know, skating is a whole different game, <laughs> um, a whole different skill to pick up. And so it, it was... Um, and it doesn't always rely on roller derby in particular. It doesn't rely on the same set of like athletic skills that you often draw on in more traditional sports like basketball or volleyball or track or whatever it is. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience to me of like sort of trying this sport, but also not having a background in it. Um, and but I, like I said, I'm competitive and I wanted to learn it and I wanted to be good. I don't think I ever really achieved that necessarily. Um, but I, but I really did devote a lot of time to it, um, for a few years while I was getting my doctorate. And again, I don't think I could have, um, I I could not certainly have written this book without those experiences. I'll say that at least. 
I, uh, I want to jump into the origins, but I want to ask you kind of one more methodological question first, just because you, you brought it up a little bit there, which is, you know, that you, you rely on a lot of like oral histories and you adopt this kind of insider outsider perspective and what you call a critical feminist perspective. And so I wondered a little bit, I mean, I loved it, but I wondered a little bit how, um, how that undergirded your project. Like what, you know, is there kind of a, a, a political through line from the beginning or did this become generative when you were actually playing in the modern iteration of, of roller derby? And then you were like, Oh, this provides like a structure to what I'm, you know, method and structure to what I'm seeing in the past. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think the answer is twofold. On one hand, I always knew I wanted to do an oral history based project. My master's thesis was um, oral history based. I'm an oral historian by training. Um, And so I knew that I wanted to talk with people who had been involved in the sport, of course, and to get their firsthand experiences, in part because women athletes are usually left out of sports histories. they're, you know, they're always compared to men. Their stories are not covered in the papers in the same way. They're not covered in traditional sports journalism or media in the same way. And so I wanted to know what their experiences were like from them. So I would say that definitely, um, I went in to the research knowing that I wanted to do that part of it. Um, and I also knew that I think, or knew that I wanted to take this sort of critical feminist lens to the project as well. Um, but I do think that that also developed in a particular way the further into the research I got because I, I, in some, it really took me a long time to sort of grapple with and tease out and make sense of, you know, roller derby seemed so progressive when you hold it up in the 1930s through the 50s compared to any other, not only sports, but well, women's sports, but sports in general. Um, And I just kept wanting to be like, this is so progressive. This is so progressive. And this is feminist and everything about this is great. But like the further I dove into it, I, you know, could see the ways in which it was still constrained by um, society, by the patriarchy, by um, larger forces, even as much as I wanted to scream that this is so interesting and this is so unique. You know, it it was a balance and they were always walking sort of a a tightrope or, you know, skating a line, if you will, um, between how much they could push and how much they were replicating popular culture and, um, you know, other restrictions of the time. So I feel like that is something that, again, I always came at this with or from a feminist perspective, but I, I had to really dig deep into that to make sense of what was happening and push myself a little bit more than I think that I wanted to in the beginning of my research where I really just was like, this is so progressive. This is so different than anything else. Um, so that took a while to tease out, I guess I should say. Yeah. I, I, um, I had a weird kind of, I don't know when you read two things and they're both are, are working well together, but then they're both pushing each other. I'm reading a friend's book on feminism and child rights revolution in Australia and that's happening in the 70s. But so many of the things that these radical feminists in Australia were fighting for at the time were where I was seeing them in your book. It was like, huh, yeah, there was, there was a kind of communal child raising kind of situation going on. Mm-hmm. And there was equal pay mm-hmm. and all these things. I was like, wow, yeah. roller derby. But then your book kind of pushed on that to go, OK, wait, there's still all these patriarchal structures. They're not getting away from that. Um, and sometimes they're right. even strengthening them. Uh, so it's really kind of a rich read um, that illuminated other work as well. That's I, great. Might, Glad to hear that. It, it might be time, though, for for the listeners, at least, who haven't read the book. Uh, well, let's let's get into it. Where does roller derby come from? It's such a it's such an interesting sport. But where does it get a start? And who's Leo Seltzer? You've mentioned him a few times already, but it's time for us to learn it. <laughs> right. Fair enough. I'm just assuming that everyone has read the book, and I'm sure that's not the case. So yes, let me tell you a little bit about it and a little bit about the history. (laughs) Right. Let's hope they're just intrigued enough to go do so afterwards here. Um, But so Leo Seltzer started as a sort of entertainment promoter in the late 1920s, 1930s on the West Coast. And as the Depression, um, Great Depression, developed, he started getting interested in like walkathons and dance-a-thons and things like that, but 
came to realize like there wasn't a lot of money in that people might come see it once but they're not going to come see a walkathon like 10 times like that's not happening right especially with um, money being tight um and he ended up becoming one of the main leaseholders in the chicago coliseum um again in i think the early uh 1930s and relocated to chicago um with his his first wife has died so he, he takes his kids with him to chicago and um gets this idea of putting on a roller derby. Now there's a lot of sort of, and really over the past few years about did Leo Seltzer invent the sport of roller derby or really does he just um, corner the market on roller derby? (laughs) Um, He claims to sort of have invented it from scratch, but drawing on ideas from walkathons, danceathons, the six day bike races that were really popular at the time. He takes like jams from those. Um, but in reality, roller derbies had been held for really a couple of decades and various roller skating marathons um, prior to this. Um, and so he just sort of like puts it into a nice, neat show. And then, and I can talk about this here in a minute. Essentially he, um, trademarks it so no one else can use the name roller derby um but anyways the first roller derby is held in august of 1935 at the chicago coliseum it's a big hit um originally it's called the transcontinental roller derby and the original idea of the sport um or again more endurance race at the time was they had a lit map in the background and they were going to be roller skating across the country so from some point on the east coast um, all the way to somewhere in California. And it was, you know, anywhere from, I don't know, 2,500, 3,500 miles that these uh, skaters would be racing each other. And they'd be on the track from anywhere from like eight to 12 hours a day. Um, they had other entertainment things going on when um, when the skaters were there on the track, um, other little like sort of gimmicky type stuff to get people in. Um, and so again, it's sort of this endurance race of couples, a male and female couple that are racing other skaters or pairs of skaters. And they would also have like little sprints or jams that skaters could engage in like for side money while they're doing this much larger race. Um, And over the next couple of years, um, as the transcontinental roller derby sort of begins traveling across the country, um, you know, they're kind of wanting to spice it up, if you will, to make sure that that fans are um, wanting to come back and see it. And it sort of evolves into more of a team sport from there, where you have um, five pairs on one team against five pairs on another. And they're still doing the race across the country, but it's more of a team effort um, of essentially 10 skaters on each side. And then eventually uh, they begin adding contact and it evolves into sort of more of the modern sport that we know and understand it to be today. And I'm happy to talk further about that, but I'll pause there um, to give you the answer to that question. No, no, that's great. And I, I am wondering, you know, so one of the big, one point that you make throughout the book uh, and one of the big in, in, interventions it seems to be that roller derby was doing at the time is that it had you know men and women competing kind of together um maybe not all that always together but on the same teams and sometimes at the same time so i was wondering if you could talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about why that emerges that way and then what was the role of women in early roller derby i mean because they weren't just they weren't just sometimes the players they were also the fans and the organizers and things like that so Yeah, I would argue that women have driven the sport (laughs) from its beginning um, through, again, the whole, excuse me, seltzer era of the sport, which lasts to the mid-1970s, and then, of course, with the modern revival as well. Um, But this is where I think Leo Seltzer was a brilliant brilliant businessman. Um, He understood that people liked to to see women... um, as athletes on the track and then later like through contact like fighting on the track and doing that too but also that women were sort of an um I'm not sure what the phrase I want to use under tapped market um that if women buy tickets the men will follow <laughs> and that he could capitalize on that by bringing women in to see other women athletes competing on par with men and as you just know most of the time men and women were on the same team and they're scoring was kept together 
although they weren't always on the track at the same time, although that does happen upon occasion, if their partner would get hurt, if their male partner got hurt, the women, uh, his woman partner would come on the track and skate with the men too. Um, so it, that was not uncommon that they were on the track at the same time, but sport was not structured like that per se. But men and women were teammates and their scoring was um, kept the same, whether that was the endurance race or when it evolved to more like the contact sport that we know. Um, so again, I think that is where Leo Seltzer really capitalizes on roller derby and makes it unique when he adds contact and when he recognizes and understands and then caters to not only the female skaters, but the female fans too. One of the things you do in your book, and I don't, I don't know that we can talk about everyone is, is that you're, you're really great about, because you do oral history, you're really great about actually discussing um, people, right? The sport for you isn't bloodless and, and it's very much a sport that's peopled by people who get their whole story. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about some of the early competitors of roller derby. If I'm back there in the Chicago Coliseum, who would I be seeing? Yeah, that, that's a fun question. Um, so some of the early stars, which were women, within the first year or two, there was a popular skater by the name of Ivy King, who was sort of the pretty skater that you know everyone idolized and wanted to be like. But then she was sort of in contrast to one of the, I would say the first real gate attraction for the roller derby was Ma Bogash. Um, and she, she was, was my favorite. <laughs> um, yeah, she sounds amazing. I wish I could have met her. Um, but she started roller derby when she was like in her 40s, I think it was. Um, and basically, she decides to join the roller derby to prove her husband wrong, which is like the best story ever, right? Um, but she had di she was diagnosed with diabetes, and her doctor essentially tells her that um, she needed to get in shape. And she wasn't a big athlete prior to this or didn't play other sports. And so she really liked roller skating. So she begins going to a roller skating rink. She's uh, from Chicago and um, becomes a, a pretty prolific skater. And then she and her family are at the very first roller derby that is held um, at the Chicago Coliseum. And essentially, she sort of makes a bet with her husband. She says, these female skaters are not very good. I could, you know, outskate them any day. And he's like, well, let's see you do it. Um, and so she <laughs> attempts to join the roller derby um, because how it used to work is, um, you know, there's not just a roller derby school at the beginning that you can just pick up skaters from or whatever. So they would sort of go scout and recruit at local roller skating rinks, but then they would also have tryouts um, in the off hours or at the end of a stint when they were in Chicago or then when they went to St. Louis, they would have tryouts for local skaters to see if they could pick up any new talent. Um, so Ma, Ma Bogash goes to one of these early tryouts when they're skating in Chicago and she drags her son, Billy, with her. And he was not a particularly strong skater at that point, but he becomes a big star in his own right too within the roller derby. Um, and basically they say, well, we'll take Ma, but we don't want Billy. And she says, well, we're a package deal. Um, so they take them both. Um, and she becomes an early star in the sport, not because she's sort of young and glamorous and beautiful, but because she is the every woman. You know, she is a middle-aged woman who is out there skating her heart out, trying to prove her husband wrong. And people just were drawn to that. Um, you know, sort of her story. And, um, you know, she also would pull antics on the track. I've read a couple of different stories about her sort of being stuck in a pack of skaters and she'd pull like a, a pin out of her hair and like poke them so they would get out of her way. Um, so again, she um, was one of the uh, early skaters um, that, that had a big name. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones uh, to highlight as well. Mary Upel played for a really long time. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how many you want me to, to go into necessarily, no, but no, Ma no, Bogash no. is well, a great story you're, you're, early on. I was hoping you'd bring up Ma Bogash, but I, I didn't want to force the <laughs> issue. <laughs> no, um, yeah, no, no yeah. but I mean that for real, like your book, there's a lot of um, sports histories that focus more on kind of structure or, things like that. And you end up realizing there's no people in it or very few athletes. 
Um, I say that as a person who wrote that book as well. As well. Um, so I'm guilty of what I'm charging other people of. Um, but one of the things your your book does is that it tele- telescopes nicely between kind of individual biography, but then also looking at, at kind of the broader the broader picture and uh, just move moving kind of out of chapter one into chapter two, thinking about uh, skating through the boundaries of identity. Um, all these different figures, they allow you to talk about how roller derby challenges or not some of the gendered social expectations of mid-century American sports and life. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why roller derby might have been a challenge to people's expectations about about gender and sport and gender relations in society. I mean, it's kind of a big question, I know, but you wrote the book, so... <laughs> Uh put me on the spot there. Um, No, so I think, you know, women's sports change drastically, I think I would argue, throughout the course of the 20th century. But if you look at sort of the heyday of roller derby, really from its inception in the mid-1930s through its golden era in the late 40s into the early 50s, I mean, this is such an interesting time for women in American society in general, um, where you know, gender roles are changing, but they're sort of temporary. Like if you think women during World War II, they're asked to come into the workforce, but then they're promptly sort of, if not pushed back out, at least pushed back into more traditional jobs. Um, You know, they are increasing access to sports, like through industrial recreation and even women's AAU leagues. And we have the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League during World War II. Um, And then in the 1950s, you have this sort of supposed return to tradition and normalcy, but that's also not the reality of a lot of women's lives um, in the post-war era. And so in some ways, I think like roller derby reflects that and is always trying to balance between pushing the bar of like, look, we're doing this really cool thing where women are on par with men and look at how great of, um, look how athletic they are and how tough and rough they are and skate is you know, well as the men do and fight and it's exciting to watch. On the other hand, also not turning away this traditional fan base, what is middle and working class folks, right? Who they're trying to make up that that base, um, the, the fan base. So they're also then highlighting like, well, they're roller derby skaters, but they're also mothers. They're also wives. They're also Um, you know, love to stay at home and cook spaghetti and and do these other things that supposedly women, you know, like to do. Um, There's, you know, a couple great quotes from various skaters. I know, I think it's Gloria Mack at one point says, you know, all I want to be is considered a lady. Yes, I play roller derby, but, you know, I I love my home and my husband and just want to be seen as, you know, a a normal lady. Um, So they're always, you know, kind of, pushing the boundaries while also trying to put up the sort of publicity of, no, we're just like you too. Um, And we are traditional as well. So um, again, they're always sort of walking that line with that. And it's also interesting. I mean, this gets into the sports entertainment piece of it too. You know, Leo Seltzer, who is the founder of of the the roller derby, um, you know, he he does want this to be seen as a true sport, but how do you convince mainstream journalists to cover it as such when you have these professional women athletes? And as he's trying to convince everyone to cover it on the sports pages, though, he's also a sports promoter and is a businessman and needs to make money at the gate. And that includes, you know, Sometimes having people put blood capsules in their mouths and when they fall down on the track, it looks like they're bleeding or, you know, the women fighting or doing these other antics that also makes people question its legitimate, excuse me, legitimacy um, at various points. So, again, he's like balancing all these different pieces to it. And I feel like I went way off track there, but you can bring me no, back. No, on board no, if actually, you no, 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 I, no, I definitely, it, cause I'm looking at my, the questions I wrote out for the chapter, but I'm talking like one of the other questions I wrote was about, you know, how they were always trying to balance between sport and spectacle. And I feel like that throughout your book is kind of inter- intricately connected to this, <laughs> this inclusion of women, because 
part of what you draw out in your mm-hmm. work is that like the gatekeepers of sport, because women were included, you know, automatically tried to slot it into spectacle. You know, especially yeah. the journalists is really sad to read that they just refuse to write about it. Yeah. Um, basically. Yeah. And it, <laughs> They did. And it's it's interesting, though, because people like also were not very consistent. And I found that in some of my more recent research, too, even after the book has been published, like depending on what papers you're looking in, it's like sometimes they'll cover it in the sports pages, but sometimes it's like near the marriage announcements. Like it's just all over the place in terms of of where they're putting it and why they're putting it there. And if it is on the sports pages, usually it's really um, uh, derisive, I guess, Um or, or critical of the sport. Um, but I, I guess I did want to, I do, I absolutely want to talk more about this um, balance between sport and spectacle too. But to get back into the identity piece, this is also something the women themselves were grappling with. You know, they wanted to be taken seriously as athletes and as professional athletes, and that this is their career. Um, but, you know, as women athletes have had to face throughout much of the 20th century, um, because they are participating particularly in a full contact sport and not say tennis or ice skating or these more traditional sports that you have that are played by white middle class or upper class women um, in in the mid 20th century, um, they're constantly you know being called rough, being called unladylike, um, you know co- a lot of code words for um, you know saying that they're homosexual um, or sometimes like just outright calling them lesbian, whether they are or not, but just because they're pushing against these boundaries of traditional middle-class white heteronormative femininity um, that is sort of mainstream at the time. Well, one of the things, and this was just a great chapter, um, one of the things that Roller Derby tries to do to kind of emphasize the normativity of their competitors is they host these beauty contests. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, I found that just fascinating. Yeah. in roller derby is not the only organization to do this. So AAU basketball, women's basketball, basketball, excuse me, becomes popular in the 1930s, 40s through the 50s. And they also do similar things. So other sports are drawing on this idea. And it's, again, just gets down to apologetic behavior. Hey, these women are playing a sport. Um, We don't want them to seem masculine. So we are going to hyper feminize them by making them participate in a beauty contest. Um, But that really does stick with the roller derby. And we're all familiar, no matter how much you really know about roller derby, you've probably heard the phrase roller derby queen, right? Um, there's a song about it even. Um, so it, it does become known for that. Um, and it's interesting though, because they also have a roller derby king contest, but the sort of parameters of that contest are a little bit different. Um, but essentially it, uh, in the early years, it was just kind of a popularity contest where fans would write in, and, you know, kind of vote on their favorite skater. Um, at least that's what I think Mary Upel claims. She's the first roller derby queen. And I want to say it was 1938, excuse me. They take a, a few year hiatus on that and then come back in the 40s and 50s. Um, and then it's basically like, who do you think is the prettiest skater? <laughs> and um, there were ballots that were printed in the Roller Derby News, which was a popular publication that was put out by the Roller Derby itself. Um, and fans would vote in on who they thought was the prettiest skater. And that would be, they would sort of tally votes uh, for a couple months at least, and then hype that up in the paper um, and kind of get quotes from the women about it. Um, But when I interviewed the women, most of them like did not care about that at all. (laughs) And like, didn't really want to talk in depth about, I don't know if they, um, you know, were sort of like, embarrassed, um, you know, talking about how people thought they were pretty or what it was. Um, But just, you know, that was not something it was clearly promotional and gimmicky, I guess is what I should say. It was not something that they really cared about. It was like, oh, I really want to get roller derby queen this year. Like nobody said that. Um, So they understood sort of the purpose of it. um, But it was not something the skaters themselves like valued in any way, shape or form. Yeah, it. um... That chapter for me really like highlighted so much of how 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 
expectations about beauty can can shape kind of the ways in which people perform, but also how agentic some of the women could be, some of them caring, clearly some of them n- not caring to look, uh, to look um, quote unquote feminine, you know, wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. Mm-hmm. But that also there are real limitations, like there, you know, racial, um, LG, LGBTQ um, potentially athletes, you know, not not being able to get the votes because it was like a popularity contest. So it was a really fascinating chapter. Yeah, I, thank um, you. And yeah, I mean, there's. A, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please, you go ahead, please. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, you use the word performance, and that is a really, I mean, they are performing femininity, right? But as you note, that not everyone can even perform that. I mean, they're by sort of white middle class standards, um, you know, the, the Black women that skated aren't going to be able to, you know, embody those standards by society's norms. And so, of course, that's problematic. But at the same time, roller derby is wanting to be accepted by mainstream society. So they are um, replicating these standards. And that's where it becomes obviously very um, problematic. Um, But the other piece, too, of like how skaters navigated those issues themselves. So like I was just thinking from a moment in the book where Jerry Murray, who is really the most popular skater in the heyday of the sport, um, you know, talked about I mean, she was like. I would never wear makeup when I skated. Like, what would be the point of that? You're sweating. It get, you know, it just drips off of you. That's gross. Like, I would never do that. But she would wear hair bows or she would wear these, like, scarves tied around her neck or even, like, gloves at various points um, to kind of, like, play into that. And other skaters, you know, would do their hair, like, in pigtails or um, – braids or or what have you like so it wasn't always standard of what people are doing for this sort of apologetic behavior or this performance of femininity um but they all were i think most of them were like attempting even unconsciously to engage in that to make sure they're not turning off fans at the same time yeah it was it was um one thing that sets it apart for me when i was reading it was really fascinating it's just how, how in some ways the radicalism of the of the sport could be driven by the by Leo Seltzer or Jerry Seltzer, but also by the athletes, mm-hmm. and that appealed to different mm-hmm. groups of fans. Like I loved that it was roller derby was super popular with the New York uh, or, and Hollywood set. But the chapter that I thought was the most radical, like had showed the most radical um, potential in some ways, was that chapter diaper derbies. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit because. This is so unusual in some ways. I, I didn't, I haven't heard of any other sport that has policies like this. And women are obviously still fighting about getting some of the things that roller derby competitors had today. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how roller derby dealt with family, uh, motherhood, children, um, and why was it just so out of out of the future in some ways, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And this is where I think roller derby really should be examined, you know, as a case study, because you don't see this in other sports and where it is the most progressive. Um, Very early on in the sport, you know, Leo Seltzer realizes that he needs women skaters. Um, And if they get married and have kids and quit, then he essentially loses money and he loses skaters and it's hard to train a skater from scratch and what have you. So at first he tries to ban his skaters from dating each other and from marrying each other. Um, And then he quickly realizes like, okay, I can't actually do that. Um, And they're going to get married and have kids anyways. So then he like kind of encourages them to date amongst themselves um, and really, they're sort of naturally going to do that anyways, because they're traveling all around the country. They're really young. Um, this is exciting for them. Um, and you spend not like, oh, hey, we are at the gym or at the rink for two hours today. Like they're there. They live in these rinks and uh, it, um, coliseums and armories and where they're playing sometimes when they're booked for a month out at a place. So they, you're literally spending like 18 hours a day with the same people. Um, So, of course, they're naturally going to be drawn to each other and they understand each other's way of life. Like this is a very hard knock life um, traveling around the roller derby. It's a rough sport. People are getting injured all the time. So, of course, they can relate to each other in that regard. So then he begins, um, Leo Seltzer begins sort of like encouraging 
um, you know, the skaters to date and, and marry amongst themselves. But ultimately, he realizes, like, you know, I can't control whether the, the women are, are going to have kids, obviously. And so he just makes it accessible and makes it um, builds family into the roller derby. And in some ways, it had been that way from the beginning because it was a family like he and his brother um, owned a skate company. Uh, he had his daughter and son-in-law working in the front offices. Like there were a lot of relatives sort of involved with it um, on, on his side from the get-go. It's always been a family affair. And again, you have like Ma Bogash and her son that are playing. Over the years, you have like brother-sister teams. Um, you know, whole families are joining the roller derby. So um, he recognizes that that's sort of an important piece to it. Um, but especially these big stars, like he doesn't want to lose them. So he's making it okay for them to bring their kids with them on the buses or, um, you know, traveling separately in a car, but following the bus. Um, he sends like advanced men into the next town they're going to, to make sure that the hotel rooms are set up, that the hotel rooms have cribs um, or a babysitter or strollers or whatever it is they need. They bring trainees with them that aren't ready to skate on the teams, um, and they serve as babysitters for some of the couples that have their kids with them on the road. Um, so he makes um, a lot of adjustments to accommodate this life. And again, obviously, that affects the women in particular ways. It doesn't necessarily affect the men, but um, it, it, it allows... I, I mean, in some ways, he's just more accommodating toward he allows the male skaters to be fathers, too, and not to also have to choose between being just an athlete or a dad. Now, of course, I think that's a bigger choice there for the mother and affects their lives differently. Um, but but he does this across the board for both uh, male and female skaters. Yeah, I, um, it's hard to it's hard to just state how how revolutionary this must have been at the time, because it just is kind of of, of all the letter, you know, before even the radical feminist movement is, has adopted all of these things. Roller derby's done it, you know, um, you know, yeah. roller derby is doing well, equal pay. Roller derby is accommodating families. It's just, I was, I was shocked. Yeah, it is. And, and in some ways, I guess it is super progressive. Of course it is. I make that argument myself. On the other hand, it's also a promotional strategy because remember they're, they're playing this, game of no these are normal women they're yeah they're rough on the track but she, it, she's a mother like look at her cute kid so they are publicizing that in the newspapers um you know uh highlighting the family atmosphere at to also counteract the negative stereotypes that are emerging about the female skaters so it is radical and it is progressive and i don't want to undercut that but he also uses that to his advantage to normalize the women at the same time. Yeah. I, I, I could talk about this longer, but I don't, I, there's two other <laughs> chapters in the book and I want to try to get, get to the end because the yeah. last chapter about kind of contemporary roller derby is also fascinating, but so then maybe, you know, we haven't really hit on, or I haven't hit on one of the things you talk about in the book was just how popular roller derby is. But then, you know, it goes from being one of the most popular sports on television. And then in the 70s, it just collapses. So maybe you can tell us a little bit kind of briefly about why roller, why the Seltzer roller derby ends and, you know, mm -hmm. why it needs to be then rejuvenated in the 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Leo Seltzer, again, sort of found the sport, if you will, in 1935 and continues to operate it through the 1940s. And he sort of um, settles the sport in New York City. And uh, they have a TV contract through, uh, I think, the is it 1952. Um, and then he just struggles to get his footing um, and to keep the sport sort of going after that. He can't find another TV contract. Um, so the operation's low on money. Um, and he decides, like, we need to move the sport to the West Coast, and we're going to try to make it big there. Um, and so he, you know, moves the operation to California. And then Leo Seltzer realizes, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of decades now. I have some other interests. He was wanting to pursue some real estate and some other things like that. And so he decides that he wants out. And at this point, his son, uh, Jerry Seltzer, 
um, had kind of grown up around the sport and um, had just gotten out of the army and had also uh, had been helping out doing some trackside announcing. And I think he was working for the uh, roller derby skate company that his uncle Oscar um, owned uh, sort of jointly with Leo Seltzer. And so um, Leo Seltzer kind of decides he's going to walk away and maybe even shut down the sport. And Jerry says, you know, let's pause that. Um, why don't you let me try to take it over um, and see what I can do? And so Leo does. So Jerry Seltzer becomes the sort of second owner of the roller derby. Um, and I believe it was 1959 or so, but a lot of different things are changing and happening at the same time. So, right, they relocate um, to California. There's a lot of new advances with TV and uh, television syndication that are going to affect the sport. Um, but essentially, they have the second resurgence under Jerry Seltzer on the West Coast. And um, roller derby becomes very popular again, but it also becomes more theatrical than it ever had been before. Um, and towards the end, it sort of tarnishes its own image, um, if you will. But uh, so Jerry Seltzer keeps it operating for about uh, 15 or so years. And I think it's 1973 when he also decides he wants to get out and there's not enough money. And so he closes down um, this, the Seltzer family roller derby. Now, I say all that to say that the Seltzer family roller derby was in many ways the main component or business operation when people say roller derby anytime from 1935 until, you know, 1973. They're generally referring to the Seltzer family roller derby. But outlaw units constantly would crop up where skaters would get angry at the Seltzers over pay or, you know, being transferred to one team or the other or whatever, and would start their own roller derby um, in a particular location or even one that traveled around. But because I think I alluded to this earlier, Leo Seltzer had trademarked the name roller derby. Nobody could ever call it that. So you'd hear these other names like skating derby or roller skating competition. I don't know. They would make up all these different names. And so none of these units really last very long until a competitor um, that also has several names but called Roller Games emerges um, in the late 50s or late 60s too. And they sort of operate side by side with the roller derby until the mid 1970s. And then Roller Games also folds. So what happens at that point from the mid 70s through the 1990s, you have a series of leagues that will pop up here or there, um, particularly on the West Coast in um, California, but sometimes on the East Coast as well, usually operated by former skaters that had either been involved with uh, the Seltzer family organization or roller games or both. Um, but none had the lasting power, or the staying power of the Seltzer family roller derby. and um, so again, there were some operations in existence, but nothing on the scale or magnitude or with the popularity of the original roller derby. Um, and then we do have the resurgence in the late 1990s on uh, cable TV. Uh, roller Jam lasts for a few seasons, uh, but they were on rollerblades and that was very staged and theatrical. Um, and then you have the sort of modern, what I call the modern roller derby, um, start out of Austin, Texas in 2001. And I'm happy to talk further about that, but if you have a specific question, I'll no, answer no. that too. Uh, well, I would, I, I actually, I want to, I mean, I had, I have tons, I write down tons of questions, but, um, I think <laughs> given, given the time, I think we need to talk about chapter six. I think we need to talk about DIY roller derby because that's what a lot of people will be familiar mm -hmm. with. And there's a lot that's going on. That's quite different. Um, from historic roller derby, and then there's some legacy. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how roller derby revives and what makes it particularly different now versus kind of the Seltzer organization um, from the 30s to 70s. So, yeah. Yeah. So roller derby emerges in the early 2000s, like I said, out of Austin, Texas, and it, it sort of begins just as um, this group of women that are sort of, um, you know, uh, hanging around the bars and particular, like, fun part of Austin, and um, they decide they want to form roller derby uh, league, but they don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> they don't really, and I don't mean that negatively, like, roller derby hadn't really been around for a while. They have sort of this general generic idea of 
of what it was, um, but they're just kind of excited to like start this thing that is unique. And there was a guy by the name of Dan Policarpo who supposedly originally had the idea to do this, but he really wanted it to be sort of like a circus freak show. Um, but then with these like hot women on skates that were going to be fighting each other. Uh, but anyways, there's a sort of falling out. He supposedly skips town with money that they had raised, but then they're already sort of invested. They had started skating. They had started researching the, the old game and learning more about it. And they decide they want to move forward with it. And so there's this organization that forms called it Bad Girl, um, Good Woman, or BGGW, um, uh, that starts roller derby. And again, like I said, um, they don't, I, I mean this politely, <laughs> they, they don't know exactly what their vision is, and they don't really know that much about the old game. And so they're still trying to find their footing. And at first, they think it's going to be like a for-profit organization. Um, but they were kind of burnt by this guy who had stole their money. And so they want it to be female owned and run and, you know, uh, em empowering the women. Um, but there's a lot of sort of early drama between um, various factions in that organization, and they end up splitting. And um, eventually what emerges out of this is what we are somewhat familiar with now as modern roller derby, which is flat track roller derby that is sort of um, feminist bent, um, you know, uh, female empowerment, but with this also DIY ethic that that we're doing it ourselves, um, that we are in control of this, um, and it's grassroots, um, and it's sort of radical in that regard, which is what's amazing about it. Um, and so that spreads very quickly in the early 2000s. Um, eventually, they form a governing body within the first five years, and it really spreads like wildfire fire across the United States and then um, across the world, really, um, and, and very quickly. Um, and so there's a lot of really interesting components about it, but even what emerged within those first few years has already changed within the last, you know, we're, what were like two decades in at this point, um, where it the early skaters were really big into alter egos and sort of fishnets and hot pants. And there was like a sort of sexual aspect to it, or at least flaunting sexuality, but we're in control of this and it is feminist and we are doing this for ourselves versus a contingent that started to emerge of like, we want to be taken again as a serious sport and maybe we want to be in the Olympics or maybe we want it to be professional. Um, we don't want to use alter ego names anymore. Um, and we want to wear uniforms. And so there's sort of this evolution over the last 20 years, of course, which I think is natural to some extent over what is modern roller derby going to be and what are our principles um, and how are we going to promote ourselves? And I don't know if there's a complete consensus of that even now, um, but we've seen that shift um, really over the last 10 years. Yeah, I, um, I think this chapter is really great for kind of highlighting because you never you never abandon that critical feminist perspective. Um, so one of the things that this chapter does really well is it highlights the, those continued tensions that even though it's now dissentered, female-led, um, grassroots, do it yourself, it, it doesn't mean that that suddenly all the problems are over and that there's still kind of um, maybe inherent tensions in the kind of sport itself. And one of the ones that you've, you've um, alluded to at the beginning of our conversation in, in talking about your own participation was the, the participation of men in modern roller derby which remains a kind of complex issue. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And then I want to ask you quickly about the Olympics so we can bash on the Olympics people. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, it, it, the timing's perfect for that, right? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's really interesting because when modern roller derby, again, emerged in the early 2000s, a lot of men participated in the sense that they were there supporting their girlfriends, wives, uh, sisters, buddies, you know, whoever. And they were um, referees. They were coaches. There were a lot of men around, um, but they were not skaters. They, they were not participating. And then sort of as the sport grew and, and you know, more people um, are loving it, you know, 
men were like, well, I would like to play too. This, this looks fun, right? So there's a handful of men's teams that pop up that are really attached to women's teams or were part of what had been um, women's leagues. And the one I uh, joined um, was a co-ed league in that regard too. Um, and it was sort of the same thing. Um, and I, I mentioned this in the book. Um, my league was um, co-owned originally by um, uh, a couple, uh, Sarah and Jake, uh, Jake Fahey and Sarah Lang. And Sarah started skating. Jake's like, well, I, I'd like to do it too. You know, it looks like fun. Um, but they never wanted to, at least these early men's teams, you know, didn't want to intrude on this feminist space. They wanted to support it. Um, but, you know, women were very leery because if you look at the history of women's sports, you know, there isn't mm -hmm. a lot of space that mm -hmm. has been just their own or that they have had control over or didn't just become an auxiliary of, if you will. Um, so now that women had control of the sport that that was really, you know, unique and interesting and exciting, they didn't necessarily want to give up that control. Um, so there's sort of this long um I guess, path where men who are participating in a roller derby are trying to also, you know, create their own version and their own sport while trying to support the women, but also be like, we're not here to take over or we don't want to step on your toes necessarily. Um, but, but finding that balance, like how much do you work with them? And what I find so fascinating about this, because I totally get, <laughs> um, you know, the feminist piece of this, of not wanting to include men, like that makes so much sense to me in, in a lot of ways. But roller derby was the only sport from the beginning that was co-ed, right? So like roller derby had done the co-ed thing from the beginning and it had worked. So that's what I found most interesting, um, you know, as I was studying this and as I was reading more about like women's responses to the men playing, it was just like that went against the history of the sport. Although I also understood absolutely why they were taking that perspective. Um, but what ends up sort of evolving is that the men form a, a governing body and they have now since partnered with the women's governing body and women's roller derby is still way more popular and way more populated than um, men's roller derby. Um, but I, I, there isn't the sort of fear and tension that there was in those early years when men began forming their own teams. I think that is in many ways um, sort of smoothed itself out. Although that doesn't mean there's no tension on this angle, though, right? And so that brings us up to the Olympics question. And what do you what do you think the future of roller derby as a as a kind of final question? What do you think the future of roller derby is? Is it going to be an Olympic sport in L.A. Um, when we get the Olympics, or, or what's going to happen? That is a very important and good question, but I don't know that I also have the answer to it. In part because I think COVID has really um, no one's been able to practice or play for the last couple of years. And I myself haven't skated for the last few years. So I'm not completely in tune with the most recent conversations or have like my, don't have like a great sense of where a lot of the leagues are feeling about joining the Olympics or retaining amateur status. But like when I was playing, that was constantly something that we talked about, like where was the sport going? Um, you know, who was going to be in control of it? Do, do we even want to be a part of like the Olympics or try to go down that path? Because that means that we lose our own control and you have to follow all these rules. And yeah, let's be honest, the Olympic committee does not have a great reputation uh, in a whole lot of sports. So like, was that even something that we need or want? So I don't know that I can make a guess or an assessment as to what will happen. I think it'll take a long time. And I think there really will probably be a lot of splinters because people feel very passionately about that one way or the other. Um, and so I can see where there, there could be leagues or organizations or even an entire governing body that says, you know, we don't want to go that path. We want to maintain control. We want to keep our amateur status. We want to have our own tournaments, our own World Cup, our own um, you know, both national and international tournaments. And that's just not for us. We see it as being unhealthy um, and it's not good for the sport. But I can also see that there's always going to be competitors who want to do it at, you know, the highest level. And, you know, that is the Olympics, whether we like it or not. Um, so I, I don't know that there will ever be a full consensus on that. And it will be interesting to see particularly what happens in the next few years as leagues emerge out of sort of this uh, COVID um, pause because a lot of leagues have not been able to practice um, and have not been able to um, 
get back into sort of the momentum that they had really going into 2020. Yeah, I would I would love to see roller derby in the Olympics, but not um, not under the terms that they that the international sporting orgs seem to want them to come in in the final chapter of your book. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. A female led grassroots DIY roller derby in the Olympics sounds great. Uh, IOC I agree, led, but at what led. cost? <laughs> yeah. 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 It does. History, history is, if we can look back to history, that doesn't end well for us, right? So yeah. I, I understand the people being leery on that, but at the same time, there's such a prestige around Olympic sports and being an Olympian and being included in that. Uh, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> well, thank thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for joining me. And I want to say for the people who are listening, this is definitely one to pick up. It was a fascinating book. And as much as you think you know about roller derby, you don't. <laughs> this is I, I learned I learned a ton and I most importantly had fun while doing it. I think I mentioned to you before we started uh, recording that it even caused me to watch a whole TV show because there's a French TV show about roller derby. And I was like, now I want to learn about how it's being depicted in France. And I watched it in a night. I was so into it. Um, so I, I was really just uh, had so much fun reading it, really enjoyed it. And it was a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you so much for reading the book and um, for inviting me to, to be on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking with you. And um, yeah, I mean, I obviously love talking about roller derby and I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Well, I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Michelle Marino, who is the deputy director of the Indiana Historical Bureau, a division of the Indiana State Library. And she's also the author of Roller Derby, the History of an American Sport, out from University of Texas Press in 2021. You've been listening to New Books in Sports, a channel on the New Books Network. And I am Keith Rathbone from Macquarie University. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.